We're going to continue our theme, refocus. And I think that's what we need, is to refocus on what is important in our lives. Because, folks, even the world says life is short. But they say, let's eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. Yeah. We, in the other way, we say, life is short. Let's tell others about Jesus, because they don't know what's coming for them. Look at verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Look what it says. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain lame man, man from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that enter in, into the temple. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such I have given I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaped and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praised God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture. Lord, you continue to do miracles in people's lives every day. And Lord, when a soul receives you as Savior, it is a miracle. It is a miracle in the making, Lord. We see this one right here. We're going to talk about this one right here. But I pray, Father, if there's someone here this morning and never received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, or even someone online tonight, this morning, May they consider you. May they call upon you for salvation. Because, Lord, they have to understand you're the only bridge to heaven. And they need to accept that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So looking at the subject of refocusing, we have that. Uh, of course, uh, we would try to get that picture of, in the old days, we had those cameras. We had to refocus or refocus the camera in order to get a good picture. And, of course, uh, you look at the pictures out of focus there, so we need to refocus. I think sometimes what we need to do is need, we need to refocus on what is important to us. This morning I talked with the teenagers about walking. I said to them, your mom and dad's walk is not your walk. You have to have, uh, uh, the, Paul said, we have to walk worthy of who we are. So you have to make a decision and make your choices what kind of walk you're going to have that will shape your life. So we talk about places like uh, casinos and gambling and uh, nightclubs and all kinds of things that is out there today for teenagers and what we do and what people do with those. So I think it was a good conversation. I'm enjoying teaching them because we're talking about these topics on which many people get involved to, just everyday life, things that would help them. Of course, uh, they, they, they are making more and more decisions. I told them, I said, the moment you get your car, it means freedom. <laughs> so you're going to make decisions that your mom and dad's not there. You're going to listen to music that nobody, your mom and dad's not there. So nobody, things that nobody knows, but you know. And that's what kind of walk you're going to have you. I said to them, and your God. It's not your mom or dad's God, it's your God. So it makes it makes a, try to make it personal to them to understand. And I think we Christians, we come to a point in our lives too, we need to refocus on what is important. What is important to you? What you need to focus this morning? So I'm going to give you a story. The title of the message is, Caring Makes a Difference. Are you a caring person? Folks online, are you a caring person? Do you care? Or well, life is all about you. Well, let me read you a story right here for the sake of introduction. This man, Robert, went to a large discount store one evening to buy a pair of shoes. As he walked up to the counter, he noticed that he was the only customer in the area. Behind the counter was two salespersons. One was talking on the phone and, and refused to acknowledge him. The other was at the, the end of the counter unloading merchandise. So the Robert became very impatient and walked to the end of the counter 
where the salesperson, the, uh, the salesperson was and asked for help. She said, you got a number? I got what? Asked Robert. You got a number, sir. Robert replied, lady, I'm the only customer in the store. I don't need a number. Can you see how ridiculous this is? But the lady insisted, Robert, uh, take a number before agreeing to wait, uh, to wait, uh, to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to wait on him. So it was obvious she was more interested in following certain procedures or rules than helping a customer. So Robert took a number from the machine, and she went, and, she, and it was number 37. He walked back to the lady. The sales lady looked at her at uh, her number counter, which revealed the last customer who had been waiting on the, on, uh, on the number the 34, she called number 35. Then she go, number 36. Then they go, number 37. Robert said, it's me. May I help you, she asked, without cracking a smile. No, said Robert, and he turned away and walked away. <laughs> uh, so let me... <laughs> Got a Kleenex here. So, uh, I wish I could say that kind of senseless, senseless, and senseless insensitivity and lack of concern for the customer is only limited to the business community. But unfortunately, it's not. This type of uncaring attitude goes every day in the hearts of many people. We live in a selfish society where people don't care about anyone else but themselves. I think we have a very caring church here. I do. Ask the people that come here on Saturdays. So now, have you ever been in a situation in which you looked completely hopeless? You look around to others for help and concern and then found out that 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 they were completely indifferent and, 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 and apathetic to your problem? Have you ever cried, does anyone care of what happened to me or of what happens in my life? Have you ever been there and seemed like nobody cares? Are you living in a generation, we, we are living, I'm sorry, in a generation of hurting people who want to know that someone truly cares about them. Folks, don't you ever think that everybody is okay? People out there are hurting. People in the church might be hurting. But I tell you what, we need to show a caring heart towards people. To care means to have thought or regard towards another, to feel concern about people. Let me put it this. Was Jesus a caring person? Yes. Then he's, the Bible says he was moved with compassion when he looked at, at the, the amounts of people. He said it was sheep without shepherds. Did he feed them? Yes. Because he cared. Get this. If we are going to be a church or a, or a, a Christian that pleases God, we are going to have to take care or to, uh, to, uh, to care about people who are hurting. For, listen, folks, people are hurting because a lot of them are lost. We need to care enough to go tell them the truth. If we don't care, we won't open our mouths and tell. At least we need to pray for them. If we don't have the opportunity to tell them, someone else will come along. We have learned from the first generation Christians that health relationships make a di or, or healthy relationships make a difference. In this lesson, we will learn from the example of the early church leaders that caring for others makes a difference. When Paul wrote to the believers in Philippi, he spoke highly of two caring men, Timothy and Aphrodias. They were among this small group of loyal helpers. Paul lamented the lack of similar men who would naturally care for. And the well-being of those in Philippi, actually see this in Phil uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Look, I'm going to read it to you. It says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ's. So, folks, selfishness is not something new. Selfishness always lives in the heart of man. We are selfish by nature. Look at kids in the playground. Look at kids in the daycare. Are they selfish? 
Yeah, you see, when they learn that stuff, it's natural to them. It's natural to us to be selfish. We don't need to have a society telling us, but if society promotes it, it gets even worse. That's what we have in our world. Folks, folks in order to, for us to refocus on the ways of the Lord, we individually need to exercise care for others. In order for us to move forward and grow both spiritually and physically as a church, we must, we must refocus on caring for the needs of others, both spiritual needs and physical needs. From this sense, in the lives of two, two early church members, we see three components of genuine care here in this passage. And let's look at this from, from three points this morning. We see the plight of a, of a needy man. Look at verse 2. And a certain man... A certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beauty, to ask alms of them that enter in the, tem uh, in the temple. So, folks, we live in a society that continue teach, uh, teaching that life is about self. I hear in the workplace all the time, you deserve. You work hard all week. You go do this. You, go, you deserve. Why don't you come with us? Have some fun. You deserve it. Really? Now we're supposed to work to f help our families. Isn't that what we work for? You know, we work for others. And the pe people in the family, they might not be able to work, but we provide all these things. You see, we have to be caring people. And we see right here, we live in a society, and I say society, an American society, a very selfish society. I'm not saying that everybody is selfish. Don't misunderstand me here. I'm saying we live in, in a general, generally speaking, in a very selfish society. There's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of caring people out there. There's a lot of people out there that give everything they could give to help others. I know that. So, there are not, there's nothing wrong about one taking care of himself. We should. Actually, we should take care of ourselves, but there's a line on which we must see that there is a limit to self. Get this. Life is far more fulfilling when we have, certain, uh, we have a caring spirit who is willing to extend a helping him, a hand to those who are in need. You say, well, nobody is in need in our society this day. Everybody's rich. No, there's a lot of needy people out there. Did you notice lately at the gas pump, you see people that go ahead of you. Do you see the, the, what they, the amount of, uh, of gas that they put in their pumps? Do you see it? $10? $5? $20? What does that mean? They're struggling financially. That's what that means. If we don't, you don't have to ask. You can see it. I was, uh, I was at, uh, at the pump twice this week at, at uh, BJ's because it's usually where I go because it's the cheapest place I could find. And, and, and I observed those things. I'm not trying to do it purposely. It's just the Lord. Just put, and I'm looking at it. There's a, two people ahead of me. I saw that. I look at the other pump. Same thing. I was like, wow. And I observed that to the friend days. So it is a need. Prices are high. Everything is high. People I need. So the inconvenient the reality is that the opportunity to care always begins with a need. We tend to avoid needs because, after all, we have needs of our own. Our actions seem to say, don't bother with me, with, uh, with me because I'm a needy person as well. But if we strive to make a difference, we will express care for others. Now, folks, the great reality is that all of us have needs. All of us are, have, are needy people. All of us need help. We might need physical help. We might need spiritual help. We might be crying today because we need somebody to come and encourage us. We all needy people. We need each other. We need each other. Folks, don't you want a shoulder to cry if you are hurting, if you're discouraged? You don't want somebody to talk with to help you up? Of course you do. What about if you're in a physical need? Don't you want somebody to help you? Of course we do. Now, the great thing is to witness uh, a needy person helping another needy person. To take a look at this, at this man in our text, this man had a, at least three dying needs right here. Letter A, he needed strength to walk. 
Look at verse 2. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried. That's the word there. Whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. So this man was a handicapped man. Something that was very hard in those days. And it is today as well. But this man was handicapped. I don't believe that this man uh, had a wheelchair. Neither any, had any form of transportation. The peop- there was people that carried him. Obviously those people saw the need. And it, uh, every day pretty much pick him up and put him in that place. So he could make a living. There was no social programs in those days, folks. The government did not care about you in those days like that. Today we live in a social program. Everybody receives something. Hey, you know, praise the Lord if they do, if they have the need to that. But in those days there was no such thing. He had to go make a living. So this man was trying to make a living by begging because he didn't have any other source of income. He couldn't do anything. So this man was simply laying there day after day, helpless, helplessly sick. So this man, in many ways, describes the ocean of people who live around, uh, around us who are diseased with, this, with sin and, mor- and, and morally crippled. And listen, folks, what are we doing as a church? What is the Christian church doing to reach people today? Right. May we be careful, though, we don't get so many entertainments and we forget that there is people living outside the walls of the church who needs Jesus. I'm not trying to be an evangelist this morning here, but I'm trying to what? That's my heart. People need to hear the Savior. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that caught my heart is when I hear someone that, was, that I know that died without Jesus. You see, this man describes the ocean of people around us. And we're witnessing of, of, a, of a society who is caring more and more, uh, doesn't care, uh, I mean, it was actually dying more too, because the more corruption that is going on in our world. Sin is not sin anymore. Who is right and who is wrong? So we live in a world of confusion. Where is the truth? Where do you find the truth? A society that needs someone to show them that we care. Listen, folks, if you bring a gospel track and give to someone, it shows that you care about that soul. If you tell someone about Jesus, it shows that you care about that soul. It's better than food. I mean, we know we need physical help, physical food, but they need the words of life. They need the Savior. I know, folks, that increasingly we find ourselves uh, uh, repulsed uh, by the depravity of this world. The prophet Isaiah graphically described mankind's sinful condition using imaginary or in the physical disease and decay. Actually, go to Isaiah chapter 1. Look at verse 4. I want you to see something here and keep your finger on your text there. Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, Ah, sinful nature, nation. Uh, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord and have provoked the Holy One of Israel, of Israel unto anger, and they are gone away backwards. Why should ye be stricken any more? He will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart fainted. You see, it says, verse 6, it says, for the... For the Soul of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and, and bruises and uh, uh, petrifying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither uh, mollified with ointment. See, uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah right here, he's describing, was that America? I'm not saying that's what he's prophesying by America. Was he describing the condition of our society? The moral corruption that goes on. People speak all kinds of garbage. They don't even be re- concerned about who's listening to. In front of little kids and in front of people. It's amazing how, how, how moral corrupt is our society. And folks, what do these people need? They need people who care. You go tell them there is a Savior. There is a heaven. There is a place to go after this life is over. Let it be. He needed substance for living. This crippled man was asking for alms in here. He needed financial assistance to meet the needs in his life since he was physically unable to earn an income. So he was begging. 
Folks, I don't know about you, but I, I have met people with many physical needs. People who need help, a helping hand. People, they need people who care for them. We also will meet people who have, I mean, physical needs, of course. We have a, in our church, we have, of course, our food pantry. Listen, we're not here just to give food away. We always make sure they get food and they get the gospel with it. You think, why do you think I make sure that when they come in, I make them sit down? I invite them for a cup of coffee and a donut and a muffin. Let them talk with us. I want to create a relationship with them. I want them to know that we care about them. Before we give them any food, I want them to know that there is a God that loves them. I ask them if they go to church. I ask them what church they go. And most of them, they don't go to any church. And I invite them to come to our church. I said, I'm not trying to put a bait. I'm trying to help them. It's not putting bait to entice people. They need the Savior. Right. <clears throat> Just if they call, you can only see that. Now, let me remind you that, that, that when you give, when you donate, I believe that you are doing with, with a caring heart. Folks, that's what we need to continue to do. Continue on serving others with a caring heart. So if you give to missions, what do you do? You give with a caring heart because you know that those men that are in other parts of the world, they are preaching the gospel to needy people. That's what they're doing. And you know what? You put that in the bank of heaven, in heaven because you might get to heaven someday and someone will come to you. It's because of you that I am here. Because you supported this person and this person reached me with the gospel. Isn't that wonderful? If you gave your tithes to the church, what do you do? You, make in, you promote your church, you make your church keep going so your church can be a light in the community. Folks, we're not, folks, we're not playing church. This is reality. Right. This is what God told us to do. Listen, if I think that, that I was going to start a church just to play church, I wouldn't be here. This is the reality of who we are. We are Christians. The children of the living God and the church is to be, you know, the, the shining block in the, in the neighborhoods that people can see, I have a need. I need a Savior. Jesus spoke of the importance of a caring spirit. Go to Matthew chapter 25 and look at verse 37. Look what it says there, Matthew 25, 37. And it says, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when so we thee and, and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink. When so we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee. See, legit questions right here. And when so we, we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee. Look what it says. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye have done, done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So, folks, believe me, believe me, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been criticized heavily because of the food pantry. Not from people of this church, because everybody's with this. Well, you, you, you just become a social club to give food to people? That is so wrong. That is so wrong. It's amazing what people say. We've been criticized because we have two screens right here. They said, what's going to be next? The smoke and, the, and, and like a rock club? People have no understanding. I tell you, we'll be honest with you, folks. I tell you what, Jesus said, when you do to one those little ones, you do it unto me. So, when you have someone come, right, and ask for a piece of bread or ask for some food, what do you do? And you give it in Jesus' name, don't you? Jesus said, you give and you do it like you do it unto me. So it should catch your heart, and we should give it with a caring heart. It was a man that came here, Sean, came back here. Most of you know who he is. I was preparing a box for delivery, and he looked at me and he said, Pastor, you, you given this to someone? And he, I said, yes, that was the truth. And he said, you guys are such a blessing. He said, you don't even know the blessing that you are. Isn't that wonderful? We give in Jesus' name. And Jesus said here when this, in this passage, when you do that, you give it unto me. 
The local church meets needs like this. I tell you what, every local church should have a food pantry. It was a time it was like that. People, if they were hungry, they didn't know they could go to a church and get a piece of bread. When David was hungry, where did he go? Running from Saul. He knew there was something there. So the local church meets the needs, of course, spiritual needs, physical needs. Meeting physical needs is just one face of caring by the local church. We should be thankful to be a part of a local church that is carrying out, carrying out biblical uh, principles to the world. I'll tell you what, we live in society today, they don't see the importance of a, importance of a local church in the, in, in the neighborhood. There was a time in America that everybody went to church. Today, everybody goes to the golf, club, the golf course and go gets all kinds of things because church is not that relevant. You wonder why our society is messed up? It is messed up because people see that God is irrelevant to them. Let us see. He needed someone to care. Look at verse 3 in our text. You see in Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. I believe that this man sat at the door of the temple begging day after day, year after year. He saw so many people going out in the temple. I believe, can you imagine, I was thinking about it. Can you imagine this man, let's say if it rained torrentially, like if it was really a bad rain, this man was there, he couldn't move. He was right there. I believe this, this man was many times dreamed about being healthy and walk like everyone else. Among all those enticing in the temple and entering the temple that day, this man uh, noticed Peter and John specifically. He no doubt caught the eyes of, of many temple goers and encountered a variety of responses. But when he looked, he looked eyes with these two men and expect, expected uh, something from them. Somehow he knew, at least he hoped, he, they would help him. So more people than we realize are looking for a person for help, a person to care. Actually, there are many people around us that, would, that could use our help. Sometimes there are people in our local church that are in need and could use our help. The, the question is, do you care? Do I care about my brother, about my sister, when they're sick, when they're down, when they're discouraged, when they're beaten down by the issues of life? Patty is sick. Here we do. Let, him know that we, let her know that we care. Pray for her. My mother-in-law is sick. Let her know that you care. Pray for her. Robert's wife has COVID. His daughter has COVID. Let him know that we care. Let him know. See, people need to know that we care. Folks, let's go to number two. The pity of a caring man. The pity of a caring man. In Jesus' parable on unforgiveness, the master asked the unforgiving servant, should not, uh, should it not, uh, not thou uh, also have a, a compassion on, this, on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee, Matthew 18, 33. Jesus was asking us the same question. I had pity on you. Should not you have pity on others? Peter and John teach us that it takes, what it takes to demonstrate this type of compassion on those who are in need. We cannot just overlook on the needs of others. There are many hurting people around us. And you say, Pastor, that's overwhelming. There's so many needy people. Well, help one at a time. Let's look at this, letter A, the look of a caring eyes. Look what it says. And Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John, said, look on us. You see, Peter and John did not overlook this person. They looked at him straight in the eyes, and they looked at him. So look at, at us here. I tell you what, isn't the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan? What happened before the Good Samaritan showed up? There were the two people that passed by. You know what happened? They were too busy. They were too busy to help somebody that was assaulted in the road. Folks, I'm not saying we do that, but I tell you what, if I see an accident in the road, if I see somebody hurt, 
If I can get out of my car, I do get out of my car. And if I can't, you know what I do? I, make, I pray for that people. Was the time we were coming, I believe we were coming to church one night, and somebody, some, uh, uh, a mattress flew out of somebody's car. This lady was going in front of us, and, and suddenly I saw her car going up in the air and hit the wall. And we stopped, and I, couldn't, I didn't know why, why. So I get out of the car immediately. I went see, and I saw the mattress went on somebody's car and dragged up. And, and, and the lady said, what happened? I don't know. She was hurt. You know, we can't, I cannot help people in the medical field because I'm not a doctor, but we can help. Amen. Call 911. Somebody is hurt in here. I didn't walk away. I stayed there with that lady the whole time. And my car was parked behind. And you know how dangerous it is in the highway? Oh, yeah. I stayed there with that lady. Like, I know she needed somebody to be there for her. And I was. When the rescue came, I told the rescue, and I said to the lady, I have to leave now. You have somebody here to help you. You know what you do at the same time? Tell her about Jesus. Because right. I don't know her injuries. She hit the wall head on. They need Jesus. You see right here, we're going to see this, the, lo uh, the look of a caring eyes. You see, perhaps most of the folks to cross the, uh, cross the lame man and, and ignore him. And they walked to the temple. They were too busy. So, but not here, these two. They, fat, they, they look at him and say, look at us. Let it be the help of a caring hands. Look what it says in verse 6. Then Peter Says, silver and gold have I none. They're not rich people. They're poor. But such as, uh, as I have, give I thee. So what I have, I'm going to give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter and John did more than experiencing emotions here. They move into action. They place their hands on this man. Uh, 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 Grip the, 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 his fetal body and help him up to his feet. Think of this. God's power alone could certainly have enabled this man to stand on his feet without assistance of Peter and, John, Peter and John. But God helps those in need by using compassion people who are willing to become personally involved. God could send his angels and, and witness to people, but God chooses you and me. Could God send a legion of angels? Yes. Did God tell, send a bunch of angels to tell about the Savior? Yes, but now God chooses you and me. Why? He wants somebody with a caring heart. He wants somebody that loves people. He wants somebody who has a testimony. God transformed my life. I want, look what God did to me. Why don't you have, have something that I have? I want to give it to you as well. You see, the help of caring hands. God could heal this man, but he chose uh, Peter and John to lift this man up. Folks, there's a lot of people that need to be lifted this morning. Discouraged, beaten down by life. Nowhere to, no, nowhere to go. There are many things Jesus did that we cannot duplicate. We cannot raise the dead, walk on water, or cleanse a leopard. We can't, however, reach out our hands to lift up those who are in need. We can't do that. When you lift someone up, when you care enough to get involved, you are in that moment like Jesus. You're helping your fellow man who are made in the image of God. Whom have you lifted lately? A kind word can lift up somebody's spirit. A thoughtful act can lift a person's burden. Introducing a man to Jesus can lift him right into eternal relationship with God. Do you have a caring hands? Do you have a caring heart? Do you have a caring spirit? Because we, we, some things we think about caring is about giving things to people. Not necessarily that. How many people are beaten down the scourge? They just need a word of encouragement. Get this. Caring hands are energized by caring hearts. Number three, the praise of the healed men. Look at verse 8. And he leaped and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Isn't that wonderful? He could never stood up, but he did. He had never walked before, but now he could walk. He had never leaped before, but now he was leaping. He likely had many enter in the temple before, but now he entered, he entered unassisted. 
He was there on his own. And that's how, that's not all that, that he, was, he was doing. He was also praising God. Listen, folks, that's what we need to teach people, to praise God. Listen, we exist because of God. This galaxy exists because of God. Everything functions because of God. Man is so powerful that needs God. There are so many intelligent hands out, heads out there that say, we don't need God. Yes, you do. That's ignorance at a high, high level. When people say, I don't need God. Yes, you do. The very, the very air that you breathe every day is because of the, God's mercy and grace. Mm-hmm. And this nonsense about going to another planet where there's a lot of air and oxygen, it's ballooning. All right? That's what I put it. It's ballooning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he put life in there. Go look at other planets and galaxies. They're dead. It's just a bunch of rock and dirt. And you know what God created that? So we can look up and give glory to him. The heavens declare the glory of God. We stand in awe. Did you ever look at the heavens? Buy one of those, whatever the name is. And look at the heavens. And look at our creative God, how good he is. Number three, the, I said the praise of the healing man. Number A, he praised, he praised with, his praise was witness of God's power. This man first responded to healing was to praise God. He wanted everyone to know that God had changed his life. Ephesians 1 2 says that we should be to the praise of his glory. You, trust, you first trusted in Christ. The testimony of a changed life is a wonderful tool. People can argue about our message. When they look at you, when people actually that know you well, and you've been transformed by the power of the gospel, they cannot deny that. When I first got saved, I had somebody in my family and said, oh, I'm going to see how long this is going to last. It's been 24 years, folks. And still going strong. You know why? Because I know what I have believed that day. There are things that we get in ourselves into and it lasts for a little time. Like, you know, on the first time of the first day, everybody goes to the gym. Only lasts about three days or a week. But this is a reality. This is a way of life. This is Christianity. So the testimony of a changed life. People can resist our, our reason. We have something that is real. And we want to, want to tell people about it. We have one right here. He's going to Israel tomorrow. What is he going to do there? He's going there. One of the purposes he's going to do there is to give the gospel to people, Amen. to the Jewish people. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. You see, we live in a world that they think they don't need the gospel. I think why I'm thinking about one thing right here. We Christian people need to do a better job. I'm having a caring heart. We need to show the world that we care. We might say, well, you don't know the people that I know. Well, you don't know the people that I know. There's a lot of good people, a lot of bad people out there too. You know what they need? They need the gospel. Let it be. His praises were watched by people. Look at verse 9 and verse 10. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. It means not just some people say all the people. And they knew that it, that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful, beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happening unto him. Notice the words of all the, all the people saw him. This healed man didn't need to preach a sermon. Listen to me. He was the sermon. He didn't need to go and say him praising God. He was the sermon. They knew who he was. I'll tell you what. You are a sermon. You a Christian? Wherever you go, you are a sermon. You've been changed. You've been transformed. And you know what? Wherever you go, you are a sermon. Your behavior, your words, the way you, you interact with people, you are so you're speaking to them. Because that's where we are. This man was a sermon. You walk in the temple and people knew something happened to him. Folks, something happened to me. Before I got saved, I'm not the person I am today. Believe me. God transformed me. Talking about being selfish, I'm, I was one of them. Think about not caring about anybody. I care about myself. But God has the power to transform people, and he continued to transform people. This healed man was the sermon. 
He just did what God had suddenly enabled him to do, jumping around and praising God. Why don't we do what God enables us to do? Why don't we praise God every day? Praise God in the morning, praise God at noon, praise God at night. Sing it, the song of Zion, wherever you go. Show up to work on time. Live with integrity. Love your spouse. Raise your children, raise your children in a godly way. Do the things you, you could, couldn't do without God in your life. See, when people ask the question, you, you, you can say it, it was because of Jesus. Why are you doing what you do? Why are you living the way you live? You can just say this way. It was because of Jesus. Right. He came into my heart and he changed me. And people are going to look at you they're like you have two heads. Keep it that, way, that simple. Jesus transformed me. My brother-in-law one time in the middle of work, we were a group of people and they were mocking me because I'm a Christian. And he looks at me and he said, in the middle of all of he said to me, you used to drink like everybody else. And what are you talking about? I said, you're right. I did. But when Jesus came into my life, the booze went out. Mm -hmm. And it got quiet. And I said, you know what I said after that? Praise God. Amen. It was about six or seven of them. I got to tell them something that, you know what? God still works, and God still transforming people. I told him, you're absolutely right. I'm not going to lie into that. But you know what? I've been transformed. Amen. This man has been transformed by the power of God. But don't forget this. God used two men here to do something God could do all alone. Look what it says in Matthew 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And listen to this. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, when we live right, speak right, behave right, go to the right places, they will glorify your Father. Not their Father, your Father. Because God is not their father. Folks, let me say this before I conclude my message this morning. There are many uncaring, unloving, uh, backstabbing, two-faced people in our world. But that should not be sad of us Christians. We are to be known as caring people, a reaching church who loves Jesus, and listen to this, and loves people. We individually should be known in our homes, in our workplaces, to be caring and loving people. Because if anyone is going to make a difference in this world, it starts with God's people. We make a difference in this world. We individually should be known in our homes, in our workplaces, as caring people. Get this, as much as the world scorn us, mock us, down on us, they still need us to be the peacemakers. To be the ones with caring hands. To be the ones with loving hearts. But the, the order for that to happen in all of us here this morning, we need to refocus our minds on having caring hearts. How many thousands of dollars are given away from Christians every year for the gospel's sake? How many people, how many thousands and thousands of, of, of amounts of food is given by Christians to needy people every year in the other parts of the world, including in America? You know what? It comes from caring hearts and caring people. People who care about others for the sake of God. I'll tell you what. Something that we need to do is to have caring hearts. We need to have caring hearts. Care for others. Care for our brothers and sisters. We need to care for each other. If someone is hurting, we hurt with them. If someone is crying, we cry with them. Don't just come with that thing, oh, you will get over. She will get over. You know what that speaks? It speaks of an uncaring heart. We see them crying. We know it's a problem. We cry with them. We see someone rejoicing. We rejoice at them. Actually, the Bible talks about this. A caring heart. So I conclude. It is amazing what happens when people care. Because two men show up and stopped and look at a lame man, God was glorified. You see that? Peter and John didn't glorify themselves. He went in the temple and he glorified God. Isn't that good? 
I'll tell you what, I wonder how many people come here and get food and they're glorifying God on the way out. That church cares. The word goes around, folks. And that's what we should do. Serve our Savior with a caring heart. And serving others with a caring heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love, for your mercy, and for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for the example of Peter and John. Lord, they didn't have much to give, but they gave what they had. They had Christ in them. Help us, Lord. We have the Spirit of God in us. And help us to give to others as well who don't have it. Lord, as the harvest is plenteous out there. Many people are dying without Jesus. I pray, Father, help us to be that uh, uh, source of information that they need to come to the Savior. And I pray, Father, if there's someone here this morning and never received Jesus as Savior, may today they call upon you. Lord, we don't play church here. We're preaching and proclaiming your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.